We'll do a brief look over from last week, and then we'll get into today's uh, portion of the message. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 3 of Zephaniah. The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, pay close attention to verse 2 and 3. And, and what I want you to see, this is to God's people, to God's people, the nation of Israel. Okay? And when we look at it in today's prophet, prophetic look, uh, the church age will be gone at this point. There will only be Jews and unbelieving Gentiles, okay? And so we'll cover that in, in, in just a minute. Let's read the scripture. I'm going to try to remember to read out of the laptop uh, or pad, whatever the thing's called. Uh, I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version on this just because it's a little bit easier to understand. I don't think it harms us. Uh, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Well, when you bring this kind of message, it just really motivates people to love you a lot. Uh, but really what, what this sh shows, has this happened? No. No, that's not happened yet. So that's still something to come, all right? Uh, now, first of all, basically what God says here is I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And somebody said, well, that's not, he can't do that. There's our first problem. And, and, and really, that's our world's problem still to this day. See, God created the heavens and the earth. If he created, he is the creator, so he can do with his creation as he wishes, correct? Yeah. That's why people say, well, you know, I don't care what that says because I feel that I can name my own gender. I feel I have a right to my body. And the truth of the matter is God sets the rules. I don't believe in the law of gravity. Okay, let's go outside. Let's see if the law of gravity works that God instituted. You know, it doesn't matter what we feel or what we think. This is what God declares. And when we think that we have a right to say anything about anything of his creation, we've really transgressed because God can do as he pleases. Now he's saying, I'm going to, and if you'll notice in verse 3, I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds, the fish, and the rubble. That's in oppos opposition or contrasting to how it was created. He created the heavens and the earth. Then he created the fish. And then he created the birds. And he created beast. And he created man. So it's in, in reverse. But here, God is going to do that look down if you will with me in verse 7 it says in the King James hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God in the ESV it says be silent before the Lord God for the day of the Lord is near the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guest 
And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. So now let's look at last week's uh, part of the lesson. There's five problems in chapter 1 that God's addressing to his people. And it's in verses 4 through 12. If you look in verse 4 and 5, it says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah, against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priest along with the priest. Those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm, Molech, uh, Baal, the, these were the false gods of the time. Were, these false gods are actually demons that are worshipped and they don't, the people don't realize that they're demons and the demons possess the people to uh, burn their babies, to sacrifice their babies to, to these demons. Uh, so the first problem is idolatry. And we talked about this. Uh, if you was the relationship with God, he wants a relationship with his people. And the first problem he has is idolatry. They put something important. So if you break that down to something, and this is the, the example that we used last week, as a personal relationship, as a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a husband and wife, uh, idolatry is when you fall in love with somebody or something else. When more important than your spouse would be the fishing trip or the golfing experiences or another woman or, you know, heaven forbid, nowadays people are, are divorcing their wives and wanting to marry men. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. That's because they've went away from God. They don't want anything to do with him. Now, that brings us to the second problem with which is defection from prayer. Look in verse 6. It says, Those who have turned back from following the Lord who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him uh, or communicate with him or pray to him. And if it was a relationship, once again, as a husband and a wife, it's when you don't tell your wife, well, today I'm going to go fishing. What did you have in mind? You know, uh, Or you go out and buy a car and you don't ask your wife, you know, do you think we should buy a new car? You just go out and buy and say, look what I bought. It's when you quit caring uh, and, and you try to avoid that person because why? You're in love with somebody else or in love with something else. And so defection from prayer. So God is, is getting irate at his people. Because see, what this is going to boil down to is why does the church, as we read the dispensations of the church ages, why does the church get the uh, feel like that we get a free ticket out before the tribulation hits. This is why, because they're his people and because of their constant rebellion, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so, thank you. So, <laughs> it's when you want to avoid the company of the one that you're leaving. The third problem is, guilty leaders in verse 8 and it shall come to pass on on the day of the lord's sacrifice i will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire there's an old movie and i can't remember the name of the movie but uh i was a young boy when i watched it and tony curtis was in that movie and uh he was a, a prince and his dad was the king of a foreign land. It's kind of like Romeo and Juliet, but the, uh, Tony Curtis fell in love with the other king's daughter. And uh, I watched the movie, and like I said, I was a little kid, maybe six, seven years old. And, you know, back in those days, your family, for the most part, watched movies on, together on the TV, you know, Monday night movie or Friday night movies, whatever they were called, and we sat there and, we was watching this movie, and but Tony Curtis fell in love with the, the other king's daughter, and so he joined that king's army so he could be with the woman that he loved. And he had to go against battle to his daddy. And his daddy says, you know, I love you. And this was back in the time where they wore armor and, you know, usually sword fight, but it was also where, where a few guns was becoming available. 
And his dad says, you know, I love you. They're sitting there looking at each other at horseback. He says, I cannot believe you didn't stay with your people. And he took the gun and shot Tony Curtis and killed him. And then got down, I think, I don't know. I think Yul Brenner was his daddy. And then he went over and got him and cried because he'd killed his son. But here God is, is letting us know these guilty leaders who are supposed to be for God and standing for God's principles, they've turned their back on God and put another suit of armor on, somebody else's jersey. He says, I'm going to hunt them out, and I'm going to destroy them. All these people, there's two nations that's been founded from their foundation uh, by Jehovah God, and that was Israel and America. Our leadership, one nation under God, uh, we the people believe we have an inalienable right to, to serve our God. They're trying to take that away. Our leaders are going to pay for it like these leaders will pay for it. And we'll talk about that some more in the other five problems. But then uh, in verse 9, the fourth problem is superstitious-based religious practices. And uh, verse 9, it reads, uh, On that day I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold, those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. Uh, that master is God. But if you remember, uh, in the, uh, they put Dagon up in the temple. Remember that false god, that idol? And, and God kept knocking it down every night. And so the people at the time started jumping over that fallen idol to get into the temple. Do you understand some of these people still jump over the threshold when they come into the temple to this day? He's going to punish this superstitious religious stuff that has no bearing with what he says to do. And we have so much of it, even in, in our church, that we have to be very careful. I mean, the more that I'm studying, I want to remind myself of the grace, but I do want to remind myself God is exacting. He's very exacting. We excuse ourselves a lot of times and we wonder why our church is so weak. It's because we don't utilize the very power that God gives us and the understanding. Because let's be real honest, the reason we don't do it, because if I hold your feet accountable, that means you're going to hold my feet accountable to be the kind of man I'm supposed to be. So we let everybody, what's that word? It's an S word. We let everybody... If you slide, where do you usually end up sliding? Down or back? You don't ever slide up, do you? You don't work that way. It's kind of like we're in this, this stream, this river, and if we ever stop paddling, we don't go on upstream. We lose every bit that we gain and go back the other way. Let's look in verse 12. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. No literal judgment. He ain't going to look. He ain't. I did that. I didn't get. God didn't do nothing. See, God ain't going to do nothing. I can keep doing this. I'll just, if I do it and then I feel guilty about it or something later, I'll just say, God, forgive me. He'll forgive me. Because you know what? It, there, and then some people, even to this day in, in this land, will argue with you. They believe in heaven, but God ain't made no hell. <laughs> Friends, hell is real. It wasn't made for us. But if you reject his gift to us to get us out of the situation we're in, which is Jesus Christ, then you're condemned to go spend it in the hell that's created for Lucifer and the fallen angels that followed after him. And it is forever and ever. Uh, but the defection from belief of literal judgment, that's why they think, well, if we just pass the law and say, Abortion is, 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 is legal, then it's okay. But God's word still says it's not okay. Then we say, well, you know, if we can just get Congress to pass 
where homosexuals can marry each other, then it'll be okay. Then, then we can have the same rights as everybody else. And the truth of the matter is, God says it's still a sin. Well, I believe that the children should have up to an age of 18 to decide what gender they are. Well, that's not what God said. God says he created them male and female. All right, so these are the choices, and, and, and people don't like that. And they say, well, you know what? We're going to say it's good. Uh, I don't know if you all remember when they pass it where you can abort babies up to the ninth month. Uh, well, not up to the ninth month. What do you call it? Full term, I guess. Up to the day of birth, you can abort them. All them people celebrated in New York in front of TV cameras so everybody could see. They were so happy that it's legal to kill babies. If they confuse us, see how deception will work on us? Before long, there's people that actually believe it's okay. As disgusted as many of us are feeling about that it's wrong and it's, 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 it's murder, you know, what they'll be doing later, they'll come and say, you know what? We do it for the dogs and cats. You're old. Don't you want us to just take you out of your misery? Let us ease you out of your pain. You know, and that way you won't be a burden to your family and you won't spend all your money and you can leave half your money to the government and the other half if you have any left to the kids. Be simpler for you. And you know, there's going to be people that start believing that garbage. <clears throat> When you start defecting from the belief of a literal judgment, you start making your own rules. And they seem right in the man's eyes. Well, he's right. You know, we do. We do put the dogs down. Our poor little dog. We was talking about it this morning. If it's time to, you know, help ease her pain. But when you start speaking of God's children of doing that, I think we've overstepped our bounds tremendously. Now, if you will, we've got the five new problems I want to look at today. If you will, turn to chapter 3. And Now, I know I skipped 2. You remember last week I told you chapter 2 has to do with the nations and with the solution to these 10 problems. And uh, then I want to talk about it and how it really applies to us and if the Lord wants, we'll go back to chapter 2 next week uh, and deal with the nations that have dealt treacher treacherously with his people. And I know we have a lesson for that too, if God allows that. But uh, the sixth problem is rebellion and dirty oppression. In verse 1, it says, well, you know what? I need to go there. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. And uh, here in the King James, it says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. And what that truly means is their rebellion against God and they're enticing other people to participate in it. Smile real big. Do you notice our government trying to force everybody into what they're trying to do to the world? Do you notice that? God punishes. Now, he's talking about Israel here, but if he's going to do that to well, Judah, do you think he will not do it to the American leaders and stuff that's doing the same stuff? Do you know? that's, Now, look, we're all in agreement there. And, and now, <laughs> after a backup... I do ask God to punish our wicked leaders, both Republican and Democrat, independent. I don't care what title they hang. Uh, but I, I, I do ask them to be merciful to them because as he punishes them, we're part of this country. The punishment will fall upon us too. You understand? I mean, so this is some things that we, before we start, yeah, get them, God. Remember that get them part is, <laughs> we're with those people, you know. 
It'd be like if they're flying our plane and we say, God, strike all the evil people dead, even the leadership. Who's going to fly the plane? You know? So I ask God to, to be merciful to them like he is to me. Because, you know, we are, we are sinners to this day. And, and I need God's mercy every day. I need his grace, that's his power, to help me stand against those that's standing against me. And uh, you do too. Verse 2, the second problem is ignoring God's voice. She listens to no vote, to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Ignoring God's voice. How many times do you hear God whisper to you to do something and you refuse? You play, was that you, Lord? Was that really you telling me to do that? Lord, I was planning on going fishing Saturday. I wasn't planning on doing that. You know what I mean? I mean, Lord, I mean, don't I deserve to have a day off? Don't I have? <laughs> no, I see none of y'all do that. That's just me, right? These people did that. They ignored God's voice. They were going to do what they wanted to do. The, the eighth problem is withdrew from trusting God. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. I'm guilty. Hopefully you're not. This nation, a lot of our churches teach prosperity instead of provision. See, if you go with provision, you have to trust God to provide. If you trust in prosperity, you think as long as my 401k is big enough or as long as Congress don't get crazy and take all my Social Security or, you know, if I could just make a little bit more money, I'll have what I need so I can make sure my future is, what's that other word? My future is what? Secure. Do you really think just because you have paper that your future is secure? Well, you know... Our medical practices are so good. Y'all remember John Ritter, the actor? You know, he had that heart attack right across one of the most prestigious hospitals in the world. Do you reckon he had plenty of money to take care of any doctor's bills that might have been showing up? They couldn't save him. Money don't help you. Medical practice don't help you. God is the one that holds your life and your breath in his hand. And it was appointed for you to be born, male or female, white or black, in America, in India, in Africa, Israel. But there's also an appointment for the day that you leave. Hebrews 9.27 tells us it's appointed once. You don't die and come back as a gnat if you was bad or a camel if you was good. And appointed once for man to die. Then after this, the judgment. So there's no reincarnation. So there's no second chances. This is your chance. This is your life. It's your choice. God says throughout. I set before you life and death. You choose. Christ says, I come that they might have abundant life. Not just life, but abundant life. What does that mean? It means just like we read in Sunday school this morning. Things can be looking dark, and you can still be praising God and praying to Him. And then see God's hands work in miraculous ways. 
You have to be willing for what's going on now. But they withdrew from trusting God. Our nation in itself, we, we kicked God out back in the early 60s out of the schools. They're kicking them out of uh, the, the Congress and, and everywhere else he's at now. They want them even out of the church. And if you go with dispensations, uh, the church age of Laodicea in Revelation, the last church age, it says that Jesus is standing at the door, talking about the church, knocking to get in. You know, uh, when you start kicking God out of his own house, you've got a problem. But we've withdrawn from trusting God. We don't trust God. As long as our bank account's big enough, and even our country does that, they think we've got plenty of money. We'll just print more. My kids used to think I had plenty of money. Don't you have the checkbook, Daddy? You know, just write a check. Uh, that's how our government feels about money. But they also feel that way about military. And actually, we all do as Americans feel that we're pretty safe because of our military and our financial situation, all of which can be changed in a moment. Habakkuk was my eye-opener to realize I need to quit thinking that we're uh, all that in a bag of chips because I really thought we were. And I kept saying, God, why would you let this happen to the only nation that really stands for you? But see, we really don't stand for him no more. He was want, he's been wanting to get our attention since 9-11. He got our attention for a moment. Blink, and then things got good, and the stock market started going up, and everybody started working, and everything's great. Matter of fact, we, we're doing better now than we ever had. Let's just keep on rolling. <laughs> God says, you're not paying attention. And you've got my word in your hand. You've got the the man that will bring you the word to you if you won't read it for yourself. And we, I don't know. I, I, I'm just, do y'all feel like you've looked in the mirror any with this list that we've been over? I'm guilty on every count. And I'm supposed to be a man of God. It's, I don't know why God hadn't done that to everything here anyway already. You know, I'm thankful that he loves us like he does. Let's look in verse 3. This is problem number 9 that he's wanting to address. Chapter 3, verse 3. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. What does that mean? Let's live for the moment. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They're not even thinking about tomorrow. And, and, and you know, that's really how our government is. They, they don't, these, all these stimulus checks they're writing. <laughs> Somebody got to pay for this somewhere. Guess who's going to pay? Not me. I'm going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Keaton, you get to pay my bill. Thank you. Get a job and work hard. Jojo, you're the one. Olivia, you're going to do it. Yeah. Thank y'all. Write me another check. Our officials ain't paying attention until tomorrow, are they? Now, let me, we talked about this for just a moment. I'm going to change gears for just a minute. We have a weapon to change all this, and I'm not talking about we don't have to storm the Capitol. We got to storm God's throne on our knees. You have power. You have more power than you could ever imagine in your humble prayer to God. And we forget that. We talked about it in Sunday school. Well, the least I can do is pray. That's a, and so I asked Scott, what kind of guns he has. Powerful, ain't they? You take precaution with those because we know the power of a gun. But we pray like we're carrying the gun that Barney Five has. It's not loaded. Well, I'm going to pull my gun on you. Just a minute, let me get my bullet. You're praying. 
prayer is a loaded weapon ready to be used. God's word is a weapon ready to be used. Do you use them? Do you use them? We need to be using them. God expects us to use them. But it's overindulgence, uh, living for the moment. Our nation does that. Even we as individuals do that at times. Now, this is the one that, that hit me the hardest in verse 4 through 7. Uh, so if you will, read along with me. It's, Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. Uh, let me cross-reference that real quick. To the law. But that, uh, that translation there, law, would be the word, his Bible. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. Well, we can see that in our nation too. You can't embarrass some of these people. You know, uh, you have men that wear the pants down uh, under their cheeks. Uh, you uh, You have men older than me. I catch them out in what I would call their underwear, their pajamas, shopping. What in the wrong, What is wrong with people? They have no shame. You go up and, and try to shame them, and, and they'll, they'll do their best to shame you worse. We, we see this. And uh, The unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I have laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. Verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. For the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. We talked about this briefly in in Sunday school also. Bill Gates has just been awarded, or I guess recently, how recent, I'm not sure, probably a year or so ago, uh, to give a billion dollars, that's a thousand million dollars, to, uh, it's not called crop dust, what is that called in the skies that they're doing? What? Chemtrails. He's sowing some kind of chemicals in the, the atmosphere with planes to help block out the sun so we won't have global warming. All right, well, part of it sounds like a good idea if we have global warming. Let's try to fix what we've messed up. Okay. Uh, but, you know, even Bill Gates and all his money and all his men that's giving him all this advice and all the demons uh, is not going to stop global warming. Because God says he's going to destroy the earth the next time how? I think there's going to be some global warming. You know, it's going to get hot. Matter of fact, it says the elements will melt with fervent heat. That don't sound very good to me, Skip. Uh, It ain't if you don't know God. Especially if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There is, that is fearful and scary stuff. But now, 
Now we've looked at the, the ten problems God has with his people, and that's with Judah. That is why they're going to go through the tribulation. Okay? Now, the people of Judah, if they would place their faith in Jesus, guess what they get to miss? This? <laughs> why would you not? My question. They're blinded at the moment. Most of them. So let's find the solution. You know, and if God will do this to the apple of his eye, Israel, don't for a minute think because we're Americans, God's going to hold back on America. You know, we know, I mean, surely you know with what we've done, America has to be chastised. It can't continue, because if it does, God's a liar. God is not a liar. So let me show you something that I think might help. Look in chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Let me get to the right one in this thing. So what's the solution, Skip? Verse 1. Gather together. Yes, gather, O shameless nation. We're more divided in this nation than we've ever been in our lives. We can't even get our Christian brothers and sisters to group up together to make a voice worth hearing. Before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, verse 3, seek the Lord. All you humble of the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So what does this tell us? I don't know. I don't know if that tells me anything, Skip. It it tells us what we need to hear. The trouble that I see coming to our land, our country, is basically what I've read to you here. What this tells me in verses one through three is that awesome, terrible day of the Lord is still going to come upon these people even if they seek and humble themselves and pray. But I'm going to tell you what else I see. If you do that, that perhaps means that he will. Just like Moses said, Lord, let me see you. He says, you can't stand to see me. He said, but if you'll go hide yourself in the, your face in the cleft of the rock, I'll put my hand over you and I'll let the glory of my hind parts shine upon you and just the backside of the lord illuminated moses to, so the people couldn't even hardly bear look at him when he came down off the mount so what are you saying i'm saying okay let's pray for our country let's try to get everybody together and do what's right but even if they won't verse three is for you verse three is for me seek the lord all you humble of the land who do his just commands, are you obeying God? Do the best you can to obey him. Seek righteousness. That means, guess what? Just like Paul and Silas, you preach the gospel. They found themselves in prison doing the right thing. Most of us would complain, God, didn't you see what we was doing up there? You let us get whooped, and now we got thrown in this dungeon. But instead, they were praising God and praying at midnight, the darkest hour. And it said the prisoners was listening to them. Those were not other Christians in the dungeon with them. The dungeon is, is the third place in the Roman jail that they put convicted killers that's condemned to die usually. These were bad people they were in prison with. And they listened. They saw the, the hand of God move when he shook the ground and broke their bonds free. They saw the jailer get saved. 
Verse 3 goes on to say, All you humble of the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness. That means when you see people doing wrong, say, that's not right. Well, this is what we're... That's, that's, that's not what God would want you to do. If you seek righteousness, you have to do it, but you also have to address it when it presents itself in front of you wrong. And it might cost you, you understand? It might cost you a friendship. It might cost you uh, your job. It might cost you a lot of stuff, especially how things are going. It might cost you even more than that down the road. <clears throat> if you're seeking it, you have to deliver it. Seek humility. Be, be willing to be corrected when you're wrong. Uh, seek to be humble, not arrogant, because you have salvation. That is a gift. You, you didn't earn it. You're not special. You, it was gave to you. It was a gift from Jesus, a gift from God through Jesus. Uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it says, perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. When he's pouring out his wrath. You remember when the army was going to attack the city? And uh, Rahab said, uh, I'm going to help y'all, but you can't harm my family. And they said, tie a ribbon or whatever where we can see and everybody that's in that house, we won't attack that house. Everything else was destroyed what God does with us with Jesus I think when he's pouring out his wrath he'll put put the covering over us to protect us if we do this part friends Jesus is coming soon it is really and truly time to quit playing games about what is happening in our country this is not political, and it's not just our country. If you'll pay attention to the globe, all the governments have collectively lost their minds because it's a spiritual battle. The devil knows what time it is. He knows his time is coming to a, a draw, and they, they will do anything to win. They don't, but they will do anything to have victory. They can have a victory over us if we're not careful as individuals. There's, and, and I don't usually do this, but I would like to uh, do this while we're still on the air. Uh, before we have an invitation, I want to pray real quick. Uh, we'll bow your heads. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for all that you are doing through us. We thank you for this country we live in. We thank you for the trouble that is coming because it strengthens our faith, knowing that our faith in you, that you've called the ending from the beginning and you've used an imperfect humanity to record your words that are fulfilled sometimes thousands of years later to the exactness of a jot and a tittle. Now your word declares unto us that you've given us you have not given us the spirit of fear, but that of power and of love and a sound mind. You've also asked us to operate in that power and the power of prayer. We read again today in the Acts of Paul and Silas. And even in their dark, desperate hour, they were praising you and praying unto you and you shook the very foundations of the prison dungeon they were in, shook the bars open, the shackles off, and set them free. And yet we will not use that weapon 
And so this morning, in front of everyone, in front of your throne room of mercy and grace, and this witness in front of us here, I declare in the name of Jesus Christ, the fear that has engulfed so many of our members here because of this coronavirus, Lord, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I ask that fear to be released from these people. Turn them loose and let them come back and serve you, Lord. Use them to glorify your kingdom. Dear Lord, rebuke Satan and the demons of this disease and this lie of a disease. Lord, there is a disease, but the lie is bigger than the disease. Lord, tramp it out with your truth. Dear God, give these people a clear vision. Let them have faith in you and your word and come back into the place where they belong. I rebuke all of that in the name of Jesus. Satan and the demons of fear and, and keeping people separated, let them loose in the name of Jesus, I pray. Dear Lord, set your country free to serve you. Dear God, we'll accept anything you let us live through and we'll praise you every day. Lord, help us be the Christians that we need to be against the wiles of the devil and this evil world that's listening to them. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Johnny. Song of Invitation, Be Almost Persuaded, page 17. Almost persuaded now to be Arlene. 